Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for A Man Alone, which is episode 3 of season 1 of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review every episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, one episode at a time. In this video I cover the first season episode, A Man Alone. So A Man Alone is the episode in which uh, Odo gets upset because a man that he had arrested and put in prison before comes on the station and he is acting very hostile towards this man says he has three days to leave the station but then in the next day he's found dead in the hollow suites and uh, all evidence points to Odo as the one who killed him and an angry mob of people try to dispense justice on Odo um, and start almost start a riot and Cisco has to get them to calm down but Dr. Bashir then discovers that the man who was killed was not in fact the man they thought it was it was a clone of that man who created the clone and killed him in order to frame Odo for his own murder. But Odo discovers this and arrests the man. So, um, I historically did not like this episode uh, very much. Um, I believe I have in the past put this in my top 10 worst episodes of Deep Space Nine. Now, watching it again and, you know, doing the analysis thing and trying to analyze it and judge it on its own merits, I don't think I will be putting it in my top 10 worst this time. Don't get me wrong, I, I don't like it. <laughs> and I still don't think it's a pretty good episode. But it's not that terrible. There are some redeeming qualities to it. And I believe that like you do have to take into account part of the reason why it's not very good is that this is only the third episode and the show has yet to find its voice and find its footing with the characters. Um, that being said, a lot of things begin in, um, storylines begin in this episode, such as Jake and Nog's friendship, uh, Keiko O'Brien starting a school, um, they double down on the Bashir hitting on Dax, um, which sort of kind of began in the first episode um and kind of established more of Odo's uh character that he's the loner and people are kind of see him as a freak or you know an outcast so it's you know it's okay it's it's still yeah it still definitely pales in comparison to what the show will become but i don't think it's necessarily one of the worst episodes of the show so one thing that another thing i gotta talk about uh in regards to d space nine as a whole is the fact that it was based off of a western um the classic story is that the producer at paramount went to rick berman and had an idea for another star trek show and his idea was to do the rifleman in space and i've never heard of the rifleman because i don't watch westerns i'm not interested in 60s western shows but they were really popular in the 60s and the rifleman was apparently about a father and the son who went to a frontier town and sort of had to, you know, he was running the town. He had to shape things up and 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 there was like a, a kind of antagonistic bartender and a lot of people going traveling through the town. So apparently they, they based the show off of that. Now, see, I didn't hear this story until somewhat recently, like within the past 10, 15 years. So I never knew this growing up watching this show. And I, as I said, I'm not a fan of Westerns. I haven't really seen that many Westerns. And I don't particularly like Westerns. So I never noticed the connection to Westerns before. Like Deep Space Nine never seemed like a Western to me. And maybe that's why certain things that they do, such as in this episode where they have an angry mob um you know tried to hang Odo um that didn't appeal to me just come off as dumb but it, it's probably sticking to the theme of a western but more than that something that I've been noticing 
going through Deep Space Nine with that Western theme in mind is that the creation of the promenade or the design of the promenade is actually probably based off of an old west like town is meant to mimic that because in the old in the most westerns it would have this frontier town where it would just have one road straight down the middle and you'd have the different various buildings on either side you'd have the bar you have the brothel you'd have the sheriff's office you'd have the doctor's office um and you'd have uh, like other various shops maybe like a tailor shop uh and i re and so when I kind of noticed that for the first time, that the way the promenade is is designed, it kind of looks like it's a bit curved, but still it looks like that that road that goes through the middle of the town, and then that's why you have all the various locations like Quark's Bar and uh, Odo's security office and Doctor Bashir's uh, infirmary and uh, Garrick's tailor shop, and they're all sort of together in fact in this episode it really struck me the western thing because when the crowd started going down the promenade towards um the mob i should say started mobbing around odo's security office like you had they had a shot of like bashir peeking out of his infirmary and like quark peeking out of the bar and that's kind of evoke the image of like what would happen in the western when there was a you know a shootout in the middle of the road you'd have the people peeking out of like the doctor peeking out of his doctor's office and the bartender peeking out of his bar and stuff like that and yeah and so i as i said i never paid much attention to westerns now this is apparently an homage to the original series which the uh, original concept was wagon train to the stars but here's the thing the only reason why it was pitched that way is because westerns were such a huge thing and people in the 60s didn't really want to make that many TV shows that weren't westerns. And so that's how they had to get Star Trek made, a science fiction show about a starship um, traveling in space. They had to sell it as, oh no, it's a western, it just happened to be taking place in space in order to sell it and season two actually started looking and acting more like a western which is why i didn't like season two of the original series very much um so it was unnecessary and by the time we get to the 90s the westerns have fallen out of fashion they're not as common you just get the rare one in the movie theater every once in a while like dances with wolves and the unforgiven but they're not really dominating tv anymore and um and so i think that it was unnecessary to try to go back to a western but also to be fair um as much as the parallels striking the parallels of ds9 to a western are to me now now that i know it was based off of a western um when i first saw it as i said i didn't even occur to me and I'm sure the, a lot of people who are watching the show was the same thing. They probably didn't even notice the Western parallels. And to be fair, as the show will go on, it will resemble less a Western less and less. So, um, yeah, but once I look for the Western themes, especially in these earlier episodes, I can definitely see them. And Odo himself apparently was based off of a clint eastwood type western character in fact they wanted to get a clint eastwood type to play him and so some of the producers were surprised when they cast um renee elbishan war as odo because they thought he didn't really have any clint eastwood vibes at all but to be fair, I think he does come off as one. And so watching this episode with that in mind, the way that Odo behaves is like, oh, uh, the law is just there, you know, people, some people make it, and it's there, justice is justice, and I will do what I please, or whatever. It's that sort of defiant, you know, out, you know frontier town, sh loner sheriff kind of, feel to it but as i said like that didn't really strike me because i'm not i haven't really seen that many westerns because i'm not a fan of them but yeah so that's definitely what it's based and maybe that's 
part of the reason why I don't like this episode very much is because it's probably the episode of the show that feels most like a western. But the main storyline in in this episode is actually a falsely accused um, episode where the main one of the main characters is falsely accused of a murder they didn't commit. Now I talked about this trope before, particularly when I covered the episode um, "A Matter of Perspective," because I thought that was kind of the best falsely accused episode. But I didn't mention this episode. I forgot about this one. But part of the reason why is because usually, typically in the Star Trek Falsely Accused episode, it leads to a trial. And this one doesn't have a trial. It has the trial of public opinion. But it doesn't have an actual trial, so maybe that's why I didn't consider it. But it very much does fall in that very tired, very bland, very overused cliche of... Uh, the main character being falsely accused of a murder that we know for a goddamn fact that he didn't commit or or she didn't commit in, in whatever cases but in this case he um and, oh, in fact we get a falsely accused trial episode just like three or four episodes from now with Dax so they're doing like two in a row, they need to find a better way to sort of flesh out their main characters, because this is a way to sort of get to know Odo better, and and more, and so this is a really bland, I think this is why I had considered this one of the worst episodes of um, Deep Space Nine, is because that damn bland premise, that cliche, which I'm sick of, and I don't think works particularly good in this episode, particularly because I have no connection to this Ibudan man that Oda, like, uh, you know, he this random guy shows up at Quark's bar and Oda freaks the fuck out and is like, who is there? How did he get here? And, like, roughs him up. And then he has some exposition to Cisco about, oh, yeah, he, um, he, uh, used to, you know, I can't remember what the fuck he did, but, <laughs> but he would, like, sell, like, black market shit or whatever, but he, um, so some Bajorans considered him a hero, but he, Odo saw him let, a you know, kids starve to death because they didn't have the money to pay for it, so he knows that the guy is despicable, but he went to prison for killing a Cardassian, and Odo put him there, but um, since the uh, Cardassian occupation ended, the Bajorans didn't really see killing a Cardassian as that big of a crime, so let him go. Uh, and so Odo, but Odo sees him as a despicable man. Here's the thing: all that I just told you in the episode, we learn about that through Odo telling Cisco. So exposition dump, and um. And then we don't, they don't really explore his character after that because he's killed and then, uh, you know, they had the whole investigation. So I have no connection to this character. I have no connection to Odo's hatred for him. It just seemed dumped at me. And so I have no connection to the storyline. And plus, on top of the fact, as I already mentioned, you know for a goddamn fact that, they're not, that Odo's not guilty. It's like... They're not going to introduce a main character and make this big deal of introducing him just to have him, you know, arrested for murder in the third episode of the show. So I had a very hard time giving a shit about the storyline. Now, again, uh, they kind of modeled this off, uh, episode off of a sort of detective noir mystery. Uh, every time they do that, I think they tend to do a terrible job at it, and I'm thinking of ex post facto and Voyager as well. Um, well, Necessary Evil was good, but that's that was different. This one was just, yeah, it, it, it's not interesting, because I know that Oda didn't do it. I mean, some people could say, oh, so, but finding out how or who actually did do it is what's interesting about it, but it's not, because... I didn't have any connection to the, the victim or to the storyline. It just seemed, like, thrown at me in one line of dialogue. So, I... Implicit, the fact that I know he didn't do it, it just makes me really not give a shit uh, about any of this. And then, on top of that, you throw in the whole mo angry mob storyline, which, I'm sorry, comes off as goofy as fuck. And maybe it was, like... 
modeled directly after like some of these 60s western shows but they're out of date now uh unfortunately and it, it, by now i mean 1993 <laughs> it's 30 years ago but still it was out of date when this came out and it's certainly out of date now and so it comes off as as a silly childish cliche angry mob I, i'm gonna say simpsons mob i think i made that reference before it was might as well had crusty the clown and principal skinner and, <laughs> and with their torches and, and have that one lady going think of the children won't <laughs> someone think of the children and, and then odo could come out and be like i bring you love and then and then someone in the crowd shouted he brings us love get him <laughs> that's exactly how it comes off in this episode, it was so goofy. It was so dumb. Like, the guy was like, How do you put it? He's right. How do you put a rope around the neck of a shapeshifter? I'm like, Yeah, so you're not. Good. And uh, Cisco had an excellent point. He's like, What do you expect to accomplish with this exactly? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I don't know. We're going to be an angry mob. Ah! And, <laughs> and I think. And part of it that I remember when I first saw this episode that I didn't really buy about this, I didn't buy the fact that everyone would be scared and have these prejudices against Odo because he's a shapeshifter because this takes place on an intergalactic space station that has aliens of all different races and um, whatnot visiting the station. So it seems odd to me that they would pinpoint uh this guy just because he can shape shift as opposed to all the other weird looking aliens that have their other alien things and to be fair you could say well the all the other aliens are essentially just humans with crap on their foreheads <laughs> where Odo is a lot more different he does stand apart from them but still there's something about it i just didn't buy i was just like and plus this being a star trek show because star trek shows has lots of weird aliens all the time and it's had shapeshifters before it had big giant snowflakes that kill a bunch of people uh, it has like little monsters made out of silicon it has all sorts of weird and whatever the fuck the tholians are like it has all sorts of weird aliens all the time now granted maybe the bajorans wouldn't be used to that because they don't travel the galaxy the way starfleet does but as an audience member i'm used to that so i find it a bit odd that these idiots would be like oh it's a shapeshifter get them man <laughs> like it's and that actor who played the main like mob member character was it was not good <laughs> he did a bad job he was like oh no, 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 no. i will say the one thing was kind of interesting was when quark was actually defending odo when that guy was trying trying to talk shit about odo uh because it makes sense that um quark is like yeah that he's an overbearing oaf who's like troublesome and he's a big you know asshole and i absolutely can't stand him but he's not a murderer, and he's not a collaborator. Because, But I did like the fact that Bajoran did point out, hey, he used to work for the Cardassians. Because I was... This is one of my complaints about the earlier seasons of DS9, is that no one really addressed the fact that Oda used to work for the Cardassians. Now, apparently, when he did work for the Cardassians, as we'll find out more in the Necessary Evil episode, that he was well-liked by the Bajorians. But... Um, because he tried to be fair to them and it was better than having us but still he was a security officer for the Cardassians so he surely arrested some Bajorans who were put to death which will be covered later in season five they wait that long to cover the dark side of it so I, I always didn't really buy how easily the Bajorans accepted him so I guess it, that was one thing I appreciated that he did point out hey he used to work for the Cardassians which I think is a fair point. But yeah, so... And the whole scene with Odo going to Cisco and um, Odo's like, oh yeah, I'm just going to throw him off the station. And Cisco's like, D you know, you can't just do that. There are laws. And Odo's response, watch me. Um, and then, you know, Cisco tries, he's very calmly, very softly tries to be like, no, Odo, there's rule of law. You have to follow the law. And eventually when Odo says, watch me, um, Cisco's like, um, if you can't work within the rules, I'll find someone who can. 
I mean, I kind of like that, but I kind of hate it too because it does seem to be like went from a zero straight to an 11. Uh, it's like you're at an 11, uh, Cisco, bring it down. But of course, that's Avery Brooks for you. But um, but still, yeah, it seemed kind of fake the way he said that line too. It was like, hey, if you can't follow the rules, I'll find someone who can. Like, that seemed like, I don't know, artificial. Something seemed a bit artificial about that scene. So, <clears throat> I gotta talk about the introduction of the Hollow Sweets. Which I can't, I don't think they were mentioned in the two previous episodes. I think this is the first episode that mentions and shows, it's definitely the first one that shows the Hollow Sweets, but I think it's also the first one that mentioned it. So, before I was talking about the western town and all the different locations about you know, the bar, the, the barbershop, the, the doctor's office, uh, sheriff's office, and I also mentioned the brothel. Deep Space Nine did not uh, skimp on the brothel. It did in fact have a brothel attached to Quark's bar. It's called the Hollow Suites. So... I think they rightfully recognized that they couldn't have, like, a bunch of prostitutes working for Quark. That that would, that would have some ethical issues, particularly with, you know, the, the family appeal to the Star Trek show that sometimes some stations showed in the middle of the day. Uh, so instead, they came up with this idea of the Hollow Suites, which... Well, so we see in this very episode that it can be used for other things other than just sex because we see Dax at the start of the episode playing this weird game with this giant, giant floating ball in the Hollow Suites, but then later we get a scene with Ibudan uh, getting this massage from this lady with webbed fingers who's like kissing him and says obviously uh, they're going to get it on and uh, they make it clear in the next scene after he died that that's a Hollow that's a hollow suite, so that was just a hologram that was doing that. So basically, the hollow suite, the purpose of the hollow suite, I didn't catch this the first time I watched this episode, it took me a while of watching Deep Space Nine to catch on to this, but the whole point of the hollow suites is for people to go in and have sex with holograms, which, this is something people have been theorizing and talking about uh, in TNG with the holodeck, it's like, I wonder how many people go there to have sex, some people believe it was hinted at in the episode The Perfect Mate, where that uh, funky Janssen hot woman was making out, Jean Grey <laughs> was making out with Riker, and Riker didn't want to, didn't want to upset diplomatic issues, so uh, rejected her, but then he, call, he called the bridge and was like, if you need me, I'll be on holodeck too, so a lot of people infer he's going to the holodeck to have sex. Uh, and so it brings up a lot of speculation of, you know, do people go to the holodeck to have sex? We've seen in the Hollow Pursuits episode of Barkley going to the holodeck to make out with a hologram, holo, you know, a holographic version of Deanna Troy. Um, so that's always been a lingering question. So it's actually very interesting that Deep Space Nine fully embraces that and says yeah that's that's what they're here for these these hollow suites are there just so people can have sex <laughs> and it makes a bit of sense especially in this quarks bar situation the ferengi owned bar and uh they want to go with their old west theme and a lot of old west themes you know had brothels in it and so it goes right along with that theme and it's seems like a logical use of the holodeck so as i said in this episode we do see the hollow suites being used for something other than sex but it seemed like in the earlier seasons of ds9 that that was its primary function that's why if someone said oh i'm going to hollow suites it was assumed that they're going there to have sex like when uh jake someone was saying jake's going to hollow suites like uh you know someone else was like what what you're letting him go in the hollow suite what the hell is wrong with you i was like no 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 he's going there to play baseball it's a program that cisco brought with them like oh okay so so the assumption was he while well, he's going to hollow suites he must be going there to have sex and it was uh weird it was the they had to clarify, no, 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 he's going there to play baseball. 
But in later seasons, uh, they kind of got away from that. Um, and it became more of just your normal holodeck. Be because the writers just couldn't help themselves. <laughs> they just wanted to do the whole holodeck episodes. And so they just turned the Hollow Suites into a holodeck. Uh, the whole Vic Fontaine. Uh, God, it hurts me to even say that name. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, but it started like... In season four with the James Bond stuff and and then you got the the um, Battle of Britain that we never actually saw but we saw Brian and, and Bashir coming from it and um, you know baseball in season seven stuff like that so it I, I don't think they even mentioned anyone going there to have sex in the later seasons so it kind of morphed into oh just another holodeck which is why when i made my review for the episode bada bing bada bang which is one of the worst episodes of the star trek franchise and i 100 percent always will stand by that and it's not fun anyway when i did my review for that episode and i was pointing out all of the flaws regarding the use of the holodeck someone else pointed out well it's illogical for you to expect the hollow suite to function the same way as a holodeck this is a ferengi owned program it's not the same thing as a holodeck um except for the fact that it kind of is <laughs> like no it's like seriously is because especially the later seasons of d space nine established as clearly established over and over and over and over again that it is the exact same thing as a holodeck it just takes place in a smaller room now as i said in the earlier seasons it was supposed to be just like to go there to have sex but more and more they started using it for other things until you get to the later seasons where nobody's having sex anymore at all it's all just to do the battle of britain or james bond or baseball or fucking vic fontaine bullshit that's all it became so by that stage it is a holodeck. They're only calling it a hollow suite. Just is actually doesn't. It's meaningless. It's a holodeck, and it has been clearly shown over and over and over again to function exactly the same as a holodeck. Which is my response to that person because they were dead wrong. Of course, the hollow suite should function exactly the same way as a holodeck because that's been clearly established over and over and over again. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, now as for Keiko, here's my question. Why do Miles and Keiko arguing at, in public at Quark's Bar? Why don't they argue in their quarters so that everyone isn't staring at them and like being really intrusive? Like even Cisco is like looking at them and being like, and Quark and Odo were talking bullshit about them. And like Odo had this whole diatribe about, oh, you compromise and watch Klingon opera. Um, eh. So it's funny, I heard different opinions to that one. Opinion thinks that this was an outdated kind of chauvinistic uh, viewpoint. And they think that, oh, well, it's obvious the people who wrote this episode were all males. Um, but then I heard another viewpoint that, oh, yeah, no, Oda is totally right. This I can totally see. Uh, any married man can see that this is definitely, you see where he's coming from. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I was married once, and uh, my wife was definitely, let's say, dominant, <laughs> and would definitely decide what to do most of the time, but not always. So I don't know if I, if I buy this, his version of compromise, because in my experience, we actually did compromise. We didn't just do whatever she wanted to do and call to compromise. Now, granted, you do have to compromise. Compromising means you don't always get to do what you want, which is what Odo seems to be thinking of. So, yeah, it does seem a bit... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean more towards the people who say it seems a bit chauvinistic. Just a little bit. But anyway, uh, and it seems odd that Odo is the one talking about it, since if he's never been in a relationship before, how the fuck would he know? And a lot of people are just, like suggesting that he's been like hurt before by a woman, but 
um, we later on we learn that that it's not the case that he hasn't been with anyone. So I don't know why he would talk like that. It does seem out of place. So, um, Keiko. The this all right. So I'm gonna get more into this later on when we get to season three about how it makes no sense uh, that Keiko can't just be a botanist on the station. I don't see why not. Um, but in season three, is is more jarring. It's more obvious. But I'll get to that episode when I get to it. But this episode, um, when O'Brien says, oh, their ship's going through the wormhole all the time. I'll make sure that you're on one of them and you can study the plants. And she's like, I don't need favors from you. Like, that, that seems unreasonable of her to do that. And um, also... O'Brien saying, "Oh, we could what? Well, we could make a um, a read him on the promenade. It seems like it would be a good addition to it." And he's one hundred percent correct. It it would be a good addition to the promenade. A lot of people on the station, especially those that live there, would appreciate having an arboretum on the promenade. And she could. And O'Brien even said, "You could use it to set up the new study, the new plants that are coming through the wormhole." One hundred percent. So it seems like an amazing idea, but she shoots it down. Why? Because they just the the, um, the showrunners want her to be a teacher, not a, a botanist. Because that's another thing that's part of the Western theme is the whole uh, having a school as well. <laughs> um, and yeah. Okay, I don't have an issue with Keiko becoming a teacher. This is an interesting storyline that lasts one season. Maybe it goes into season two a little bit. Um, but it's fine, but still. And as I said, I have more of an issue when the storyline comes up again at the start of season three. That In that case, there seemed absolutely no reason why Keiko shouldn't have created our reading and became a botanist, but I'll get to that when I'll get to that. But it still is jarring here as well. It's still kind of, you feel the hand of the writer saying, no, I want her to be a teacher. Because it doesn't really, like O'Brien makes good points, and if she really wanted to be a botanist, which she should, then I don't get why she didn't just take him up on the offer. Uh... But this is the first episode we see Keiko and Molly, by the way. We see them on D. This is the first D Space Nine appearance, where they, of course, they'll become uh, reoccurring characters for the rest of the show. Now, the, the Jake and Nog stuff. I'm not a huge fan of Nog, especially the earlier versions of Nog. And I wasn't a huge fan of the Jake and Nog friendship, but it's okay. I do like the fact that. Uh, Nog is, or that Jake wants to find a friend and says, hey, you, you look like a cool guy, you're around my age, and, and Nog's like, go away, human, but eventually they become friends anyway. And I can get the whole thing with Jake sort of going along with Nog's misbehaviors in order to be friends. Uh, that's that's a common thing for kids to do. And how um, Cisco doesn't want Jake to hang out around Nog anymore. And Rom doesn't want Nog to hang out on Jake anymore. So it becomes kind of a forbidden friendship. So, yeah, I mean, that is somewhat interesting. Um, now, as for the whole Bashir and uh, Jadzia scene at the start of the episode, I think... I hate it. I hate it. This is like the worst example of Bashir hitting on... Jadzia, where, I mean, the star of the, in the first episode, when he was like, or, 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 drink, or drink, like, that was fine, but this one, when he's, like, hard out, being, like, obviously, like, oh, what's that smell, and, and, you know, and going over and over, like, your perfume or something, but going over and, like, just hitting on her hard out, where she's trying to talk him about this game, and uh, he's like, you have to concentrate, clear your mind. And he's like, yes, I'm ready. And she takes the controls to him and it instantly pops. <laughs> and she's like, it seems to me your mind's still active. And then he goes, like, well, what about that drink? And then the whole thing about him getting jealous of Cisco, like that was dumb. I'm sorry. That was dumb. I, to my memory, they don't really have an episode with him flirting with her heart out that is as bad or as annoying as this one. I think this is the worst example. Um, 
But the dinner scene with Jadzia and Sisko was kind of interesting about how they have the shared knowledge, the shared history, but it's kind of different. And Jadzia has to point out not all friendships survive, um, you know, a new host. And Sisko's like, oh, but it won't be that way with me. Um, so, yeah, that was that was interesting that they're establishing that and setting up how weird it is for Sisko, but how he's willing to go along with it. Um, but it establishes, like, again, it really shows to me how they didn't really know what to do with Jadzia's character, or at least they tried to do something in the first season that they eventually abandoned because they see it wasn't working, about her being, like, this wise sort of shaman-type character who is, like, very wise because she's hundreds of years old and she's like, has this sort of uh, um, type, like, attitude and, like, this Yoda wisdom or whatever. And you'll probably see that throughout season one. Um, but, yeah, eventually they realize that it's just not working and they get rid of it. So I can't wait for that. Anyway, um, so I would now like to thank all those that support me on Patreon. It's very much appreciated. It does help me continue with the channel. Uh, I, so I would like to give a very big special thanks to Brandon Newhouse. Thank you so much for all the support you have given throughout the years. I would also like to give a shout out to Antarius, Greg Marley, Francisco, Chuck Hooks, Kyrie091, Anthony D. Benedictus, Ricky, Manny Jester, Joel LaFalls, Alessandro Miglosio, Norman Buckwald, Stephen Kennedy, Britton Berg, and Allison Fordyce. Thank you all so very, very much for your support. So we've got a few patron comments on this episode. First comment is from Kyrie091, who says, A man alone, more like a plan to groan. Once again, Mark, I don't remember if I like this episode or not. Is Vic Fontaine in it? Should he be in it? Mark, what if they make a new series called Star Trek Fontaine? Um, so, in that case, I will stop being a Star Trek fan. <laughs> No, I wouldn't. I would just not watch that show. That would be the first and only Star Trek show that I would never, ever watch. Um, and, yeah, should this episode... Should Vic Fontaine be in this episode? Yeah, sure, he should be in the crowd going, Freak! Freak! Polly! Anyway. <laughs> um, you know, I, I gotta say, a plan to groan, one of your better ones. I really like that one. That's a good one. Anyway, next comment is from Ricky, who says, What a garbage for an episode. I mean, really, there's no value here at all. It's a cliche I've seen numerous times that the main character is accused of murder, and of course he isn't. Also, uh, this episode makes no sense that this guy would clone himself just to kill a clone, just to get, a, uh, just to get at Odo. People should... Put this uh, as the worst of season one, uh, not move along home, as there are too many funny moments uh, that made me burst out laughing, as I think it's not actually a horrible episode, but this one, this is one of the worst for, um, for me. My rating is a 1 out of 10. By the way, the worst episode of the season for me in top five worst of the show will be much later. You probably know which one I'm talking about. Yes, I do, because we're in, as normal, we're in complete agreement, so I believe it's the same one. I think it's the worst of season one and top five worst of the whole show, but we'll get to that later in the season. Um... Yeah, so the clone thing is a bit far-fetched that he would learn how to clone and just use that to frame Odo from now if he really wanted to get his revenge on Odo then I can kind of see him doing that but you know what I think is interesting about the clone thing is that in at the end of the episode when they find out it's a clone they say killing your clone is still murder and they arrest him for murder for killing his own clone. And the newer clone, they say, is just going to become a productive member of society. And it would be uh, illegal to kill it. And that made me think of the TNG episode Up the Long Ladder. When Riker killed his own clone. Now granted, the clone wasn't fully formed. 
at that stage. So it could be akin to more abortion than murder, but still, I don't know. It makes that whole thing come off as a bit, uh, a bit more shadier, especially since he like phasered it and vaporized it when it was almost fully formed. Just saying. Anyway, um, next comment is from Stephen Kennedy. He says, before I start talking about this episode, I'd just like to say Deep Space Nine is my favorite show, and that is mainly because of the characters and uh, recurring characters. As I stated in a previous comment, that I don't like to give a score under a three, as I believe, and even in bad episodes, there's always something to enjoy in it. In this episode, Keiko O'Brien opens the school, Jake and Nog become friends, and we get the best friendship in the track universe, Odo and Quark. Uh, should that be frenemy? I love the interaction between them, and they never overdo it, so I'm glad we only had one episode that breaks this formula, which I did like. We find out that Quark, uh, like Jadzia, uh, or likes Jadzia, I will talk more about the trill in another episode, or in the episode Dax. A Man Alone isn't a bad episode, as I don't mind what they did here as it works. Odo isn't some human that the mob is after, as Odo is a changeling. Odo was chief of security when the Cardassians had control of Terak Nor, so some Bajorans still wouldn't trust him. Even when Sisko relieved him of duty, Odo said, You don't know me, so how do you know if it suited my interest to kill Ibadan? We find out in season six that Odo let. No, actually, it's season five. Gotta correct you there. <laughs> we find out in season five that Odo let three innocent Bajorans die. So, in conclusion, uh, that was going to be an episode. So, I'm glad we got that in episode three instead of season two. So, my rating is five. I'm not sure what that word is. Garnerian bottles that are used in the mood rings out of 10. A bottle of tea? No, it's not bottles. It's like bullet teas. I, I don't really know what you're getting at. Um, maybe you're talking about that weird game Dax is playing at the start. Anyway, um, I disagree. I didn't buy the angry mob. I think it's total bullshit. I think they came off as a Simpsons mob, and I think it was a whole bunch of bullshit. So I don't think we need to get this at all. My humble opinion. Anyway, next comment um, is from Norman Buckwald, who says, This episode, in which really was supposed to properly introduce Odo's character with some depth, instead turns into a bad film noir mixed with Frankensteining. It ends up being mostly boring, never mind the shocking knife about the stab scene, which I admit until then I did not recall Trek going that way uh, violence-wise on TV. The twist, it was a clone and stage only furthers only further disappoint only sorry only furthers disappointment and we would not really truly visit Odo's issue as a constable for Ducat station until the two key flashback episodes that crowd against Odo Frankenstein trope was way too cliche and in rewatches I was more interested in the Keiko and Miles story instead two knives and clones backs out of ten yeah, I didn't think of Frankenstein. That actually is a good uh, analogy, and that's maybe what they were going for. But I think more of The Simpsons, because I think it gives it too much credit to compare it to Frankenstein. Anyway, next comment is from Antarius, who says, It's a new show. There are countless story opportunities, and what do they do? They use the maybe worst overused plot besides the holodeck malfunction trope. A main character is falsely accused of murder. Because we don't know the character very well yet, the accusation is maybe a little more believable than, for example, Scotty's case in Wolf in the Fold, but still, there are clearly false stakes, since otherwise this would mean the exit of a main character after only three episodes. I don't think 
think uh, the writers understood cloning at all. It is implied that the clone becomes a fully grown ed and uh, educated person once he wakes up, which doesn't make sense. You can clone genes, but not knowledge or experience. Uh, the best moments of the entire episode were the scenes between Odo and Quark. The other plots were rather boring, especially the scenes with or concerning Dax, which featured tons of exposition, exposition about trills. Dadzia is not very likable in this episode, even less than Bashir with her superior attitude. My rating is a 4 out of 10. Yeah, we'll have to disagree that Dax was more annoying than Bashir. I think Bashir was definitely more annoying, but that is just my humble opinion. Um, yes, excellent point why they thought it would be a good idea to use an overtiring cliche when they had so many opportunities to develop the show. It seems like a lot of season one, they end up doing that a lot in Star Trek shows where they'll just fall back to cliches instead of doing something original. Anyway, thank you patrons so much for your comments. So my rating for a man alone out of 10 is going to be a three very poor. I can't remember if I, I think I probably gave this like a two or maybe even a one in the past, but I don't think it's quite that bad. I think there's some good character development, there's some good setup, like the whole Jake and Nog thing, the whole Keiko and O'Brien thing, even the Dax and Cisco thing, like is really establishing the character beats of the of the show and getting us used to these characters, albeit not in the best ways, sometimes in very sloppy ways, particularly with the case of Odo, where this whole plot is just one giant cliche. And yeah, it's definitely a bad episode because it's, it's so bland, boring, so cliche. They do nothing new with this idea. And the whole thing with the clone was just silly, especially because I didn't give a shit about this character. I didn't care about the story because they didn't do a proper job setting it up. And the whole thing about the angry mob was just dumb. So, 3 out of 10 for me. So anyway, that is it for my review of A Man Alone. So coming up next on my channel, uh, Saturday I'll be over on Patreon for a revisited uh, revisiting my review for a sh for sorry for Ship in a Bottle. Back to TNG finally <laughs> after all this DS9, and then Monday back on my main channel and back to DS9 with a new review for Babel, and then on Wednesday back to TNG with a review for Aquiel, and then on Thursday another DS9 review with Captive Pursuit. And then on Saturday, I'm back over on Patreon for another revisit at this time, revisiting my review for Face of the Enemy. So that's what's coming up on my channel. Be sure to check it out as I continue to cover Star Trek Next Generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine and many more shows as well. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>